this is something that I've always wanted to do and, and sort of really get into with the NYT community because of experience that I've had and you know I've pitched for film trailers before I've written for short films I've, I've done a number of different things in the film world and thankfully as well I've collaborated with a number of great people and the person we're going to speak to tonight is one of those collaborators and it's going to give me great pleasure to kind of get into it with this lovely person in a moment and you know I honestly like I owe this guy a lot because he's he's given me opportunities uh, where other people didn't and you know allowed me to sort of sit on his couch and bug him and be a pain in his ass every time I'm in LA so you know as I say I've got a lot to uh, uh, owe him and I owe him for, for this this evening as well so without sort of much further ado I'm going to introduce you to Mr. Jeff Rona how are you sir? Oh hey Paul it's good to see you again. It's, yeah yeah it's yeah, it's uh, it's always a pleasure, whether it's in person, and obviously at the moment it can't be, but you know it's good to get together. No, right now, and... I haven't left this room in six and a half months. Wow, <laughs> what, what literally? Like not even go to the bathroom or anything? Oh, there's one attached. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, no, how's things been? Um, like... I'm in Los Angeles. We've been in uh, quarantine off and on since mid March. And uh, here we are coming up on mid-September. So that's, yeah, about six months. Mm -hmm. um, no, I get out a little bit. But, um, you know, uh, in Los Angeles, most all the venues are, all the indoor venues are still closed. Movie theaters, restaurants, bars, um, uh, movie theaters, everything uh, are closed. There's no, no, no clubs are open. Uh, in fact, se several clubs have closed permanently just from uh from this from this quarantine yeah i can believe it it's the same over here as well you know i mean we've just had restrictions put back on us uh yeah the caseload has kind of spiked and you know for as you know england not exactly known for its ex excellent weather so we've got a bit of an interest in winter ahead of us really to see what happens but yeah i'm glad that you know you're safe and and you're doing well and you know, even though you've not left the room for six months, you're still alive and kicking. Alive and uh, frequently kicking. Excellent, excellent. So I suppose the first question is, like, how has the pandemic affected you as a film composer? Because obviously we know mm -hmm. it's decimated the electronic world to a, to yeah. a large degree, but... It's an interesting question to get into about for a film music composer like yourself. Like, how has it affected things? Has it affected things? Very much so. Um, so film and television production uh, around the world shut down uh, in March. So a lot of TV series, including one that I was booked to score, had only shot a couple of episodes of a season. Um, so those got put on the shelf. Uh, the same with all films that hadn't completed principal photography, mm -hmm. you know, in, in full. Um, so I had three projects get pushed, uh, a documentary television series, a dramatic television series, uh, a TV film. Um, and those are all on hold. I had started, um, uh, a video game that I, uh, there was a video game that I had started late last year, just around the holidays, with the idea that I would do about a five or ten minute chunk of music, then they would come back to me after doing more development. Now, video games have fared much better, as has animation, um, but even, even um, video game uh, developers have had to readjust their schedules. So I've had my schedule, you know, battered around quite a lot. Mm. Um, a Netflix film that I was supposed to be scoring right about now is just starting to shoot um, right now. So that one will come through. The video game that was supposed to come back in May, I'm still waiting to get word from them. But they're, they were scrambling to move all of their programmers to working from home um, on a on a big scale AAA game where they're you know they're very used to doing motion capture which they can't do presently they use actors who are here in Los Angeles 
which they couldn't do because there's a two week quarantine to come here. And then there'd be a two week quarantine to go back to Japan. And that would tie up an entire development team for a month. Mm. Um, and they just decided that that wasn't an option. So it's progressing, but it's progressing slowly. Mm. In the meantime, I did work on another video game um, that just needed about five or six minutes of music. Uh, and that was actually pretty easy um, to do. You know, uh, I'm also involved in a lot of music licensing uh, work, which we should probably talk about later. And um, that has held up surprisingly well. Yeah. No, amazing. Uh, you know, um, I think licensing of really expensive pop music has taken a bit of a hit. Mm hmm but the licensing of of music libraries uh has held up amazingly well so uh we have a music production company here that does music for libraries uh that has a music library and um that that has that has run full force and you know at, at first we were told to slow down production and then our distributors around the world said you know what demand is not slowing down. You should just do what you would normally do. Yeah. So as a composer, you know, scoring to picture, things got things, some things got hit pretty hard. Uh, I am finishing up a documentary film right now that I'd started earlier in the year. And that actually hasn't really been affected except she went, uh, the director went back in to do some recutting. And, and so I let her do that and then came back and I'm just, probably going to finish that up uh, in the next few days mm. now it's so interesting to to hear you know a completely different perspective from obviously the home base for us which yeah. is obviously in the electronic music world and obviously you know we, we have no idea when things are going to open up again i mean i've just seen there's a, a, a ukrainian dj duo who are massive at the moment called art bat and I've just seen pictures of them playing an absolutely huge warehouse party in Kiev at the weekend. And it's really interesting, just as a side point, just to look at it and go, there's hundreds of people dancing. I've actually forgotten what that looks like. Ah, well, you know, uh, what was it about uh, four or six weeks ago? Uh, the Chainsmokers put on a live show, which they said would be social distanced, safe. And it was anything but, and they got raked for it. They yeah. just absolutely raked over the coals for being incredibly irresponsible. Um, you know, uh, dance music has an audience outside of dance floors, obviously, but it'll be interesting to see. I know a lot of, uh, of my friends who are EDM artists in different styles, house and trance, for example, are very deeply engaged in writing um, ambient music right now. Mm. Mm. Like this just seems to be what all the, you know, every EDM artist I know and, and, and then that I read about are getting more and more involved in, in ambient music. You know, any, anything chill out, meditation, mindfulness centering um you know diplo has a, an ambient project that is built into a meditation app on your phone mm -hmm. so you know uh you know diplo writing you know spa music that's that's a <laughs> maybe that says everything right there i don't know uh, how do you know the pandemic's peaked when diplo's making music for like you know jacuzzis and stuff and saunas whatever <laughs> hey whatever pays the bills right but it's interesting that you mentioned that because you know obviously your you know your your wheelhouse is, is film and tv and documentaries and games and stuff but as you've just mentioned you know you do have some friends like in the in the dance music world like and mutual sure. friends of ours as well including people like john monkman as well who's you know a really mm, good friend doing of mine. doing ambient music he mm. uh he was set to give some shows in ibiza and then they did a lockdown, and he has actually been there ever since. Mm. He can't get back. He just decided not to leave. Yeah. But all he's doing is is meditation, spa, ambient, mm -hmm. 
ultra mega chill out music mm -hmm. just like you know one note blowing in the wind <laughs> just uh, i've heard actually he drum. sent me a bunch of it we had a long talk uh maybe three weeks ago and he uh you know played me some of his stuff um you know uh, i'm friends with uh uh, Cold Blue, the German trance artist, and he's just hiking in the Alps at the moment. He's just taking he's taking a break, you know. He he's a smart guy. He saved up some money. He doesn't have to run back to work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he's he's kind of grateful for the break because he spent about two three years on the road and. Uh, Karen McCauley, who's remixed a couple of my uh, film score tracks into dance music, yeah. he seems to be pumping it out kind of at a at a fairly decent pace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's really well respected over here because he's known as Cyan, and he runs a label called Octopus Records, yeah, which sure. is super high level and and really respected in the techno scene in Europe. Mm hmm. Yeah. So I, you know, my limited exposure to electronic artists is that they're coping. Mm -hmm. You know, they're finding things to do. It may they may not be lucrative, but I admire. I'm friends with one of the guys in the Glitch Mob. Yeah, yeah. And uh, who is now totally score doing ambient uh, music. Although he just landed his first video game project. Nice. He he. Just last week, he let me know that uh, he's going to be doing his first video game later this year. Awesome. Um, and he's, he's excited about it. No, amazing. Um, it's a small game. It's, I think, a mobile game, sports game. So, um, you know, look, uh, you talk about transitions all the time. You know, uh, as artists, it should be in our DNA to adapt. Hmm. You know, um, there are musical styles that are kind of evergreen that stick around and there are some that come and go. And, you know, I think a musical style isn't necessarily a, a hill to die on. Hmm. You know, uh, I know you were involved in drum and bass for a period of time as were a number of my other friends uh, that I, I've hung out with. Um, ASC comes from the drum and bass scene. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, a few other uh, people that I know. And you know, that just isn't, hasn't been a thriving scene in a long time. So they've all, it's sort of a, well, times have changed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, is it is it disingenuous to change your musical style? And I think the answer is no. It's it's not. You know, great pop writers, great rappers, great great artists in every field. You know, explore what the options are. You know, and sometimes it's based on trying something that nobody's ever done. But you know, I mean, as musicians, our job isn't to invent the wheel. You know, um, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with um, hearing music on the radio, on on the the influential playlists, and going, what would it be like if I tried writing something like that? You know, what would it sound like if I did dubstep? What would it sound like if I did ambient? What would it sound like, you know, if I did trance? Um, and the answer is, is if you're really good at what you do as an artist, as a musician, you'll probably do something interesting, mm -hmm. even if it bends it a little bit. But um, we're all free to do whatever we want, right? We can do whatever we want. As a film composer, I get incredible liberties to take something and bend it. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, I consider that literally my job. You know, and we'll we'll talk about that. Mm. But um, you know, exploring, experimenting, uh, redefining, uh, figuring out what what's next that is both fulfilling and potentially lucrative, isn't that kind of what we should do our whole lives? Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you anymore. And you know, that's always been my experience. 
right the way back to even as a a DJ at the age of like 26, going back to college to do audio engineering with one eye on, you know, all kinds of different things, working with bands, working, mixing stuff in surround sound. Film music was a massive, massive motivator for me even back then. And yeah. I knew even back then with the way that the industry was changing that you would have to be incredibly versatile and in order to thrive in a rapidly changing industry at that stage, you're going to have to wear lots of different hats and you're going to have to be incredibly flexible and pragmatic yeah. about yeah. what you do and how you approach it and and, and what shape that's going to take. Well, that's almost like a flawless segue into talking more seriously about writing for film mm -hmm. or TV or video games. Yep. And we'll kind of treat the three of them, no matter what we call it, we're talking about all three. Mm -hmm. They are variations because I have certainly met younger uh, composers. You know, I get invited to give talks and workshops and what have you. And I wrote a book about film music uh, a few years ago called The Real World. Yeah, you did. Oh, look at that. Yeah, you did. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one and and i'm actually even working on a new edition of it again this will be my third there'll be a third edition but that edition is very valid mm. the second edition is, is a valid book i think anyway you know as a result of that book and other things i do get to meet a lot of composers there's universities offering uh scoring uh classes and even degrees all over the world now it's become a big deal the last five, 10 years, even uh, more than before. And it's amazing to me how much, uh, how often I'll meet a composer who will say, well, I only want to write music for orchestra. That's my only interest. So I'm only going to take orchestral jobs. Really? Why would you do that to yourself? Why would you ruin your career before you started it? You know, there's no such thing as, as an I'm a this composer. Because at the crux of what I do and what this whole profession is, it comes down to one thing and one thing only, storytelling. That's it. We are storytellers. We are storytellers who bring music into a story that exists on film, video, in a game, whatever. And how we do that is so highly variable. And it comes down to a fundamental process. And that fundamental process is collaboration. There's no doing it on your own. There's no such thing as a composer who goes off and creates music in a vacuum and delivers it. And it goes into the project and they pick up a check and say, Thank you. See you at the next. See you. See you at the Academy Awards. See you at the Baftas. It doesn't work that way. The job of a composer is to fulfill the vision of the people who have crafted the story. Typically, that's a director. In film, it's a director. In television, it's the producers. In video games, it's also called a director. Sometimes it's called an audio director. But an audio director is one person who speaks for many. So there's a single line of communication. Every project, there's a single line of communication, if it's being done correctly. And that single line of communication says, here's what we want the music to accomplish in this project. We want to create a world. We want to create an environment. We want to create a sense of space, a sense of dread, a sense of joy, a sense of dreams gone awry, a sense of drama, a sense of this story is bigger than life, even though it's a very intimate story, or this is a, this is a huge epic spectacle, but we want it to be a very personal story. Those are the kinds of, of instructions that a composer gets. And then on top of that, typically, not always, but typically, mostly, a project will say, 
here's some of the music that we're listening to that we think might be a starting point for this project. I've been listening to insert name of, of, of musician here, and it could be John Williams, it could be Daft Punk, could be Brian Eno, could be Cliff Martinez, could be, it could be a blues artist, it could be uh, Ravi Shankar, it doesn't matter. Typically, a composer is told, well, this is the music that we have been listening to that to us evokes the feeling that we hope this project will have by the time it's over. And you know what? That's a great thing. You know, um, some composers don't like that. They're called temp scores, right? Some composers are very offended by a temp score. You know, how dare you hire me and then tell me to write like somebody else. But that's not what a temp score is. You have to understand that the directors and producers that a composer works with are quite rarely musicians. Thank God. If they were, I mean, having worked for some directors who are, you know, accomplished musicians, they're the worst. Because <laughs> suddenly they're, you know, out, out come in these, you know, the, the nomenclature. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't want to hear that. You know, we're going to talk about, if we're going to talk about what's not working, we're going to talk about it emotionally. We're not going to say, well, gee, I didn't like it when you had those parallel fourths moving throughout that, you know, <laughs> that high part. So um, my job is to meet with, meet, meet these, these directors and producers in their world and bring my world with me. So my world could be an orchestra. My world could be uh, electronic. It could be electric guitars. It could be a string quartet. It could be a solo piano. It could be a quirky ensemble. Uh, it could be based on, on world music. It could be based on EDM. It could be based on classical music. It could be based on classic film score uh, tropes. Uh, it could be based on avant-garde music. Um, the options are are deep hmm. and the first thing I'm going to do is be a good listener and I'm going to listen to what it is they're looking for the music to accomplish why they the music they're listening to directs them to feel like well you know listening to you know 70s rock albums for some reason seems to make me feel like this road trip movie you know has a, there's a sense of nostalgia oh okay nostalgia let's talk about nostalgia you know what does that mean to you that's just kind of a word you know what does romantic mean that's just a word what does you know uh what does tension mean what does dread mean what does scary mean these are these are abstract things but my job is to take an abstract feeling and a request and turn it into an actual piece of music and not just a piece of music, but a piece of music that will be part of a cohesive whole from the beginning to the end, will express all of the emotions that need to be expressed and will be structured and shaped to follow exactly what's going on in the way that the film was edited or with video games structure is a completely different story, which we can talk about. But there in, in a nutshell, that's the way my mind has to function mm. in order to be able to be the collaborator that they're looking for. Yeah, totally. And it, it's great because this just illustrates so beautifully the main, this is the first question I was going to ask, like the main differences between electronic music in the club and festival sense and film music. Yeah. Because what you've kind of largely talked about there are things that DJs and producers like us just don't have to consider at all. You know, it's a completely you're hundred percent right. Thing. And and you know where it starts? It starts with a weird concept, and the weird concept is rules. What are the rules? So let's start. So in pop music, there are rules. 
uh, a song shall not be more than three and a half minutes. Uh, it will have an intro, uh, some number of verses, some number of choruses, possibly pre-chorus, bridge. Occasionally a song starts with a chorus and then goes to the first verse. Um, you know, the Beatles did that. Uh, every so often you find artists who do that. Um, but there really are rules. And if you want to be successful, if you want to find your music on radio or on the influential Spotify lists, you're going to follow certain rules. Country music has very specific rules about lyrics. You know, you can't be abstract. It has to be linear and it has to tell a personal story. Nothing else. Um, you know, pop music producers are so highly structured and everything is in two and four bar chunks and that's it. You don't you don't vary from even numbers of bars in any given section. Or I should say it's quite rare. Of course, you know, bands come along from time to time and muck around with meters and 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 signatures and key changes. But by and large, that's quite rare. Jazz, you have a very specific set of of things that define what jazz is. Harmonically, it's a language. Rhythmically, it's all syncopated. Um, you know, there's a head where you play the melody, then you improvise, then you exchange, then a drum solo, then a bass solo, then you repeat the melody, and then you end it. Uh, so all of these genres kind of have rules that kind of define the genre. With dance music, you have different, you know, obviously different brands. You have techno, you have house, you have you have trance, and you have variations within within those different EDM styles. But EDM as a whole, you know, the really talented producers, you know, they know, well, you need, you know, you have to build up to the drop like this, and you have to have the drop after this amount of time. And you know, like if you ever go to a trance festival, that there's that there's that ladder of up, down, up, down, up, down, and each up's a little higher, but then it has to come down. And four minutes of this and then two minutes of that and then up and then it's so predictable and everything everything works in these two four eight and 16 bar uh sections and if you vary from that people just get fucking pissed off and that's <laughs> that's the bottom that's the bottom line of that and you know it's interesting when you talk to really talented pop songwriters pop songwriters and they get an opportunity to score a film and suddenly they're faced with this issue well i have a th i've written this tune and they really like the tune and they want the tune in this scene but to get it to work i only have six bars and three beats and then something has to happen how do i do it hmm. well how do you do it that's the that's the that's the the crux of working in uh, working in media, working in 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 a storytelling environment. It's literature. It's literary structure. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody talks, the music changes. Somebody pulls a gun out of their purse, the music changes. You don't have no control over the pacing of a scene or an arc of several scenes or a montage. So this ability to make a a complete musical statement that doesn't end early or sound chopped off is is one of the great challenges that pop writers and I would think EDM writers have, which is you've been given the freedom that there is no judgment put on a phrase that is six bars and three beats or 11 bars and a three eight bar and then go to your transition. Mm. You know, um, our world is all about open mindedness. And at the same time, it's also about building music that feels organic, but it isn't. Mm. It might be 11 bars plus a three, eight bar, but the audience isn't going to know that it's all going to have flow and structure. And if you're really good at it, it's going to have a very, a musicality. In other words, you hide the seams. You know, you 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 make you make these weird structural lopsided things invisible. They don't go away; they're invisible. And you know, the good thing is, um, modern 
film scoring is a little different than old school. In old school, the composer would hit all of those cuts, you know, cut to the villain, music changes on the frame, you know, cut to the hero, music changes on the frame, cut to the helicopter, music changes on the frame, you know, uh, hero starts running for their life, music changes, tempo changes, key changes, you know, shifting on it, you know, flipping on a frame. It's become a little less rigorous in the last few years, but it's on a case by case basis. Mm. Um, and I'm talking about film and TV much more than games. Well, we'll, we let's have a separate convo on the structure of music for games. Cause it's, fundamentally a different thing because really is, yeah. the story is unfolding in real time as as the player is clicking on you know mashing buttons mm. but in a traditional scoring environment you have all of this fluid flexible timing modern scores are less inclined to hit every shot and hit every every turn on a frame and do it that rig rigorously it's eased up a bit but it is an individual decision made by each individual uh, director. Mm. And, you know, with, with action, typically it still comes down to the music shifting and flipping and making fairly radical changes, you know, as the scene progresses, which means tempo changes, slow, fast, slow, medium, fast, faster, faster, key changes, you know, tension goes up, key goes up. You know, tension relaxes a little bit, key goes down. So what would sound insane in a pop setting or in a dance setting is completely, the audience buys it. When, when music and image marry, the audience buys it. And the more it happens, the more the audience buys it. It's a psychological thing. We, we want to connect what we see and what we hear. That's it's part of how our brains uh, operate. We see something. We expect to hear something. Now, obviously, you know, um, in film, TV, and to some degree games, the creators of those projects are trying to fool the audience into believing that what they're seeing is real. We're trying to, it's called the suspension of disbelief. Those aren't actors in front of a camera. Those are characters. It's a hero. It's a villain. It's the love interest, whatever, you know, and we're meant to believe that the dialogue wasn't typed by a writer, but is actually coming out of their mouths and they really mean what they're saying and they're discovering things at the same time we are. What do you mean she lied and she's actually in Canada? You know, the photography, the editing, the acting, the special effects, the props, the sets, the whole world of making a show is to fool the audience into believing what they're seeing is real so that we can attach emotionally, that we attach ourselves to the hero and we, we root for them. We root for the couple to get back together. You know, we want to laugh. We want to cry. We want to be, we, we project ourselves into the stories that we enjoy. And what's the one exception to creating reality? Music. Scoring, film scores, are not are the one thing that defy reality. And yet, 99 plus percent of all film and TV has score and songs. And that's because decades ago, more than a century ago, they figured out that without music, you couldn't create the same sense of, of fright, of, of joy, of tension, of anticipation, of, of emotional um, catharsis without music. Music is the secret weapon of, of, that whole, of the whole world of media, mm. film, TV, and games. Just is. Mm. Uh, it's why it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's, you know, you, somebody shows how to, you know, cook lasagna on YouTube at the very least, there's a theme song because it makes it seem perfect. It makes them seem legitimate. Mm. So, um, so we, we it ends up being that we are quite subversive in what we do. 
we are truly psychological. And so we have to go by what propels the story. Mm. And, and that, that ends up being uh, our challenge. So getting back to the idea of rules, we can, we, anyone who is writing music to picture has the opportunity to pick whatever style of music they want. Again, it's just something mutually agreed upon with the people telling who have created the project that we're scoring. Mm. They say, we love electronic music, or I want synthesizers. Or they might say, I don't want to hear a synthesizer. You do, whatever it is, I want fast, I want slow. I love this album, whatever it is. That's a springboard to doing something unique, personal, drawing from whatever musical discipline that they have chosen, and then trying to own it, and then tell the story. So that's the juggling act right there. But we have to be open-minded every beat. Every beat is an opportunity to either stick with the genre, you know, here comes another kick drum on, you know, four on the floor, or, hey, I'm going to stop. What if I took the kick drum out, you know, when she looks up? Is that valid? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on the scene. Mm -hmm. It's so fascinating. So, so, yeah, so it is about, it's about not being... Uh, a slave, not being uh, beholden mm. to the genre itself. Um, you know, and that's why a lot of EDM artists who have um, scored picture have collaborated. You know, Daft Punk has had a number of collaborators help them uh, fulfill their music into movies like Tron, M83, Onatrix Point, uh, uh, Never. You know, the EDM artists who have gone on to do well, Trent Reznor, um, have collaborated with other people who are very experienced in on-screen storytelling to make sure that they adapt their music. So that's always, that's a, that's a nice luxury. Mm. No, totally. Totally. I mean, it's so fascinating because you, you bring up so many things, like I say, that, you know, dance music producers just don't have to consider in any way, shape or form. I remember, the first time I tried to do music for picture, I did a um, like a a short film for. A, uh, it was a guy who was a director who would normally direct um, like one of the big soap operas here called Coronation Street, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting because he was like, "Look, really love your dance music stuff. Like, you know, I'll give you a shot on this film." And I just remember sat there watching it, and it was just like a ten minute short, like a kind of a psychological thriller thing. And I was just sat there going, oh, my God, I don't even know where to start. Like, because I am so, like you were saying about rules, I'm so confined by my genre and, like, everything has to be a certain yeah. pace and a certain rhythm and a certain time signature. And like you were saying, it's like the seams are so interesting because it's like for me to be able to hit that moment where I need a drum to come in or another sound to come in, it's like, oh, I'm going to have to, like, fill this in with, like, some weird bar that's like seven twelfths or something like that yeah. in order to musically make it make sense. And like I say, this is just all completely alien, but everything that you say about storytelling and emotions are totally applicable. And one of the things that I found really interesting was actually taking all of that from working with the likes of yourself or, you know, working on film projects with the likes of, you know, Sasha and Junkie XL Again, you want to talk about a dance music guy who's made the transition very successfully. Like, he's probably one of the best examples. But yeah. taking all of that and actually reapplying it to dance music actually sent my musical output in very, very different directions. So thinking yeah. about all of this stuff is hugely, hugely interesting. And it's an entirely new skill set that not only does, you know, like you were saying, it, it opens people's minds up it'll have a profound influence on everybody who's watching this on their yeah. dance you know, music. And Junkie's well. a great example because if you compare his dance music to his film scoring, you, you barely would know it's the same person. I mean, he is obviously very adept at electronics and he has applied his knowledge of music production you know, his music sounds great. 
you know, Hans, he, he learned from Hans Zimmer and I used to work with Hans for years. And, you know, Hans came out of the pop uh, world and, and the advert jingle world. And he was a consummate producer as well as a good composer. And, you know, I think both he and Junkie are good examples of, of somebody whose skills as a producer of how to mix and how to make things sound great and how to make something sound big and how to make something sound small and how to build uh, energy through whatever means, you know, layering or filter sweeps or whatever it is, um, that, that, they, that they, they bring the goods, if you will. And, um, but that's kind of where the similarities end with Junkie. Um, you know, I kind of look at being a composer for media like a character actor. You know, it's not a lack of integrity for an actor to be able to change their voice, their look, their mannerisms, their body language to fill a role. They're playing a part. They are still fine actors, even though they're playing a part, you know, which may involve them changing their, their look and their voice and their from project to project, you barely recognize them. We, we are kind of character actors, you know, we bring skill and we do bring integrity. We do bring a point of view and a vision to the work, but the nature of our performance is going to be highly variable. And knowing that is a very liberating thing, you know, uh, it just, you know, it'll, it, it, sh it should feel good to not be constricted by the, the rules of the dance club and the EDM world and what uh, labels are looking for and what clubs are looking for. It should be liberating that, you know, you're going to get to score a game you know, in, in a style that you really love. You know, the last two games that I've worked on are both very electronic, um, but very different from one another. One is drawing a bit from like uh, UK Big Beat 90s. Mm -hmm. And the other one is kind of pulling from uh, ultra contemporary hip hop. Um, but not traditional in both cases in both cases it's to take the essence of and the flavor of and then write a score with it and and that's that's the critical thing you're not writing i'm not writing an edm score i'm writing a score using edm hmm. and that may seem like a you know that, that, that those are two different things hmm. you know i can do whatever i want as long as i invoke the flavor and feel and sound and and vibe of of that style that 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 the filmmaker said this is what i'm thinking mm. but i am by no means sticking to it 100% of the time probably not even 75% of the time mm. now it's so fascinating because you mention it almost like a kind of a color on the palette rather than the entire painting if you want to put it sort of metaphorically yeah speaking. it really is like like the palette then and not the painting yeah yeah and it's interesting because again in our sort of slightly more narrowly focused world of dance music especially in the more underground styles it's it's something i've kind of and and it's one of the reasons why i kind of moved into film music and 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 did some projects there because i just felt really constrained in a lot of ways because you're almost constrained by the rules like you were saying the fact that the the main thing is to make people go crazy on the dance floor and that's kind of it but mm -hmm. you're also constrained by what's hot right now what's trendy what is seen to be the the hot sure. new thing whereas like mm -hmm. with what you're saying it's like well anything goes and i can take a whole number of different styles again colors on the palette to maybe create something that's really unique, but it works for the project. So I suppose, like, again, getting into, like, sort of the second question I was going to ask you, it's like, well, you know, those dance music production skills, it sounds to me, from what you're saying, they are in some way transferable to the film, television. 100%. Films, well. 100%. You know, 
a composer for film, TV, and games is wearing multiple hats. And you're wearing the hat of composer. You're wearing the hat of storyteller, collaborator. But you, you are also wearing the hat of record producer. We're not, you know, we're not hired to think of music. We're hired to deliver a master ready to mix into the dialogue and sound effects of the project. And to that end, we have to bring our entire skill set to, to bear. Now, if I'm really good at mixing dance music, does that mean I can mix a film score? Actually, they're quite different. Um, fortunately, there's you know a million videos on YouTube on what constitutes a good mix for dialogue and 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 film and video games and uh, I mean look the concepts of a compressor and an EQ don't change but but the goals the goals shift you know you're you're not afforded the same dynamic range and in many cases you're not afforded the same um, spectral range either you know. Um, your music can't get in the way of dialogue. Your music can't get in the way of the sound of, of the film, the, the sound effects. So, you know, yes, we have subwoofers and we may have a subwoofer track that we write for specifically. And yeah, you may want to put a, a deep kick drum or drop, um, you know, or transition into the, into the uh, subwoofer track called an LFE, low frequency something um and uh, effect i think it's low frequency effect and um so you know so yeah the dynamic and 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 tonal range is is more restricted but yeah a good mix is a good mix however a good mix for dialogue is different than a good mix for a club and um it's one of the reasons that we work with we work in stems at all times so when we mix we split out you know, the, the melodic elements from the rhythmic elements, from the percussion elements, from the everything else, from the transitional elements. And those are always delivered. And and frankly, uh, it's at the discretion of the filmmaker to pull them out. I've plenty of times had uh, elements either dipped down or taken out in spots where it was deemed to be distracting. Because music can't be distracting. 90% of the time, 90% of the time, the music has to mesh with dialogue, you know, and um, which is why we kind of have to be minimalists to some extent at times. You know, there are times when we step forward and we are thematic. We are writing something that's going to repeat itself in variations throughout the score, you know, the, the main theme, the melodic idea. It might be a single theme for the film, or the project, it might be a character theme, there's a hero theme and a villain theme, it might be a love theme, it might be a tension idea that comes back every time we're into getting into sort of a, a pre-chase, you know, but um, as important as themes are, and I consider them critical to being uh, a desirable composer for media, uh, there are times when our job is to create emotion without drawing attention to ourselves. Call it underscore. Yeah. Score and underscore. Um, and so how to, how to generate an emotion without all of the elements available at your disposal, you know, without drums, without heavy melody, you know, being ambient, as we were talking about earlier. These are all, you know, vital, vital skills. How to be able to say the most with the least until you're called upon to say it with everything. Hmm. Um, often at times without the audience being aware of it. Again, making making the seams uh, invisible. Yeah. So so yeah, being a good producer is essential. It's just not be necessarily your job to be a good EDM producer, but just being a good music producer hmm. and adapting to whatever it is you're doing. I mean. You know, if you're doing a score that's going to be mostly, you know, ambient electric guitars and uh, synth and synth arpeggios, well, 
there's a good way to mix that for good good dynamic range, good you know imaging, a nice spread, uh, left to right, making it feel deep but not not too verby, you know, um, whatever it takes. So yeah, yeah, whatever skills you have as a good mixer will carry over. Same with programming, being a good synth programmer, uh, carry over. But like everything else, you will adapt to the um, the project. And it varies from project to project. Mm. TV is different than games. Games are different than movies. Uh, some movies are different than other movies. Games are some games are very different than other games. Mm. Yeah, it's totally. It's, again, you make amazing points. There's two main things I want to pick up there actually, and and one is that my experience as as being very very you know limited compared to yours is that the it's the the method of delivery and the actual life that the content is going to have and how it's going to be consumed is completely different. So you do have to make that kind of adjustment from, okay, mixing and mastering dynamically for what works in a dance floor setting is very different to how it's going to sound in a surround sound system, in a movie theater, <coughs> in Dolby Atmos or whatever delivery mm-hmm. you've got to, you've got to make. So again, like, the the production skills like you say are absolutely transferable it's just that yeah and and here's and and the good news about that is every project eventually gets an odd gets you know the audio is is completed Mm -hmm. by a mixer you know film tv games there there's an audio person whose job it is to take the dialogue of all the different actors all the sound effects you know all the sound design and then the score and make it one. And that person is the person the composer should talk to. How do you want this music delivered? How many stems do you want? Four stems, 24 stems, you know, um, is it okay for me to have a kick drum mixed in with other drums or should I split the kick drum out from other, you know, other elements? Are you gonna wanna have control over that? So every time I do a project, I get in touch with that person in film and TV. They're called the post-production supervisor who may put me in touch with the audio mixer and with the games. It's the, again, it's the audio director who will say, okay, the music's been approved. We need you to mix it. And here's how we want it broken out. And they'll give you a precise map of, we want 12 stems, high melody, low melody, high, this, low, this, Percussion one, percussion two, low bass sounds, drops, effects, transitions. You get a very specific list. With with orchestral music, they may want you to split the strings out from the brass. They may get very precise. They may want the percussion on its own stem. They may not. So um, it's project by project. So you get in touch with the um, the people who will make it, who 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 will who you will eventually deliver to and they'll um they can be very clear what sample rate what bit depth do you want it at 48 do you want it at 96 you know do you want it at 44 1 you know what do you want that's not up to us we don't make any of these decisions uh on the technology we are told what to do mm-hmm. now it's, it's it's again it's a totally different world but that's not to say that it's not something that can be adapted to and and traversed yeah the second point i wanted to bring up was about directors and we're not just talking about audio directors here uh the thing that really was very interesting to me was learning to work with directors whether it be on a short film for you know somebody's weekend project or you know, somebody who was looking after a documentary or, you know, whatever. And and the big thing for me, and I've seen a lot of dance music producers fall foul of this when they've tried to move over, is they very quickly realised that, to a, to a larger degree, those non-musical people you were talking about earlier, they're the ones who have the cast and vote on what your music should or shouldn't do. So actually... The, the opinion your opinion over the music that you create almost like not doesn't matter but it's not the most important opinion in the room and it's very difficult for some people to kind of you know, take their ego to one side 
and understand that you're there to facilitate somebody else's creative vision. And just because you mm-hmm. think, I mean, again, I've had that same situation where, you know, I worked on another short film and, you know, my my approach is to throw as much shit at the wall as possible to see what sticks. And then yeah. this guy, the director, came in and was like, don't like that, don't like that, don't like that, take that out, take that out, take that out. And mm-hmm. it was all stuff that I thought worked really well. But I learned sure. very quickly that my opinion doesn't matter because this is this guy's film. This is this guy's creative vision. <clears throat> I've got to take my ego out of it. I've got to check it at the door. And if he says he doesn't like something, don't take that personally because it's just down to this guy's or the producers of the movie or however the structure works. It's down to their vision not yours. Nailed it. <laughs> you know, you're you're a hundred percent right. I'll I'll add to it only a tiny bit. Um, generally speaking, it's not our job to become a musical secretary, which is kind of what you described, but it does happen. And you know, where where you separate the adults from the children is in what happens when you pour your heart out into writing a piece of music for a scene or whatever, and you feel just great about it, and you play it for the director, and they go, yeah, I'm not feeling it. (laughs) And um, which happens to everybody. It happens to everybody. It's just part of, of, of the process. Um, and how you deal with that rejection is how well you'll succeed in the business. So for example, do you put in any energy into trying to convince a director that you're right and they're wrong? Well, no, you don't spend any energy unless it's a director you've worked with for years who actually wants that. Um, I, I'm aware there's one director I've been able to have that relationship with, and I've seen it in other long-term relationships where you can say, look, the reason, you know, you didn't like it when I quoted that theme here, but it comes back later in the movie and the connection is just fantastic. And people are going to go, oh, but that's the same music that I heard when they, you know, hinted at this. Oh, now I get it. You're right. What a genius you are. That doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. Generally speaking, you don't get points for arguing. You don't get points for trying to convince them that you're a genius. And, you know, you're the musician, so you get to say. It's like you say. But the next question is, is well, they said it wasn't scary enough. So can I just polish it up a little bit and re-deliver? And unfortunately, the answer is, generally speaking, no. Uh, I, I've seen this, you know, I tr- I've tried it a couple of times, and it, it's just such a f- massive failure. You know, you think you've changed a piece of music by, you know, twiddling a, you know, a filter setting, and then you play it for the director, and they said, what are you doing? I rejected this cue the other day. Why are you playing it for me again? Oh, but I changed this and that. It doesn't sound any different to me. I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. Um what do you do when you really poured your heart out into something and you feel organically this was absolutely perfect for the scene and I'm really proud of this. It was a big moment for me as a musician and they just it just fell flat. And the answer is, is you lean on your technique. You lean on what they liked in their temp or, or in other pieces you've written and you say – okay, I'll put this in a rejects folder and maybe it'll come back in another scene where it makes more sense or maybe it'll just put it put it in, in another project. Um, but generally speaking, if somebody says, I don't like it, you just got to write them something new. And in theory, with the same amount of confidence and heart and, and music, musicianship that went into um, the piece that you felt so certain about, And yeah, it can be very bruising to the ego. I mean, I'm the composer, they're not, but it's their movie and not mine. So, um, you know, uh, 
I've gotten over it. Didn't take me long, you know. Uh, working in television, I've done you know hundreds of episodes of TV, and it you work really fast in 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 TV. So there isn't time to like lick wounds. You literally go back to work, and you write a new piece, and you deliver it, and you hope for the best. And um, in film, you know, you may write a cue ten times. You may write a cue forty times. You know, and sometimes you get to the point where you're thinking, please fire me, please fire me now on the spot. But you know what? Don't do it. You know, don't don't succumb to the I quit. First of all, there's no, you know, there's just no quitting in this business. You quit. It'll get out there. You'll never get a phone call again. It's just you just don't quit. You may get fired. And that's not a death sentence at all. Uh, composers get let go all the time. Um, and they get back on to other projects, you know, it's a bad fit. Doesn't, doesn't mean you're, you know, not lovable just because you're divorced. Can't remember who said it. And by the way, thank you. <laughs> um, I can't remember who said it, but it was something along the lines of like, you haven't really made it in this business until you get fired. Yeah, I suppose. Mm. I've done really well. It's only happened to me. Well, I had one TV show where I got fired every week, but then they rehired me the next day. It was just the, the producer was a real hothead, and he just it just made him feel good, you know. Um, you know, I think the only thing other than that is not being asked back for another season of a show. But often that's because they've changed producers and they want to bring in somebody that they've worked with, or they want to change direction and they don't trust that I can do it. Mm. Or, you know, they just want to, you know, sometimes if a show isn't getting good ratings, they just shake things up a little bit. So I've never felt like it was anything about my music particularly. Um, you know, I could be wrong. But um, other than that, you know, I, I think I've, I've managed to go pretty unscathed on the projects where I did get hired. You know, for every project I've gotten hired on, I've submitted countless demos for projects I didn't get. That's pretty normal for everybody. Mm. Just about everybody. No, it's really cool, man. It's really good insight. So, you know, in terms of if you're, if you put yourself <clears> in the shoes of, you know, a currently, shall we say, otherwise employed dance music producer stroke DJ who wants to possibly, you know, transition into this line of work, th there's obviously two main questions. Like, one is, you know, do I need completely different sets of like gear and plugins and stuff? And secondly, it's it's where to actually start on that process. Like, where do I start yeah. looking for work? How do I go about, you know, getting into yeah. the business? Well, I may I'll throw a couple ideas at you, and you tell me what you think. Mm -hmm. um, technology, I don't think you need anything new. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think it might behoove you to um, put together a library of orchestral samples that might be something that's not part of your normal every day. But, you know, other than that, um, wouldn't worry about it. Uh, if you rely on splice for most of your good ideas, then you're in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> that's, that doesn't fly too well. Um, but making the transition if I may, you may. Um, in, into this, into this field. Um, first thing you should do if you've never done it is find a piece of video that you can download. You know, you can get stuff off of like royalty free stock video sites and their plugins for, you know, downloading YouTube videos, grab a short film, grab a scene, grab a trailer, grab something, grab a commercial for, you know, for, for beer and uh an advert and put it on your computer score it just score it grab grab a scene and do what you think is who you are as a composer to that scene and then do it again and do it again and do it again and build up a portfolio um you can share that with um filmmakers with the video but it might be better to just take what you created musically and just send it over to them. Um, but 
it's that you it's you need to show that you have not a not a style a a a broader a broad range stylistically but you do need to show that you have a broad enough range emotionally you know how does an EDM producer express uh romance love happiness sadness uh fear uh dread uh a chase a uh a dramatic co- uh dialogue you know scene um you need to show instantly in your music it sh- you should be able to know it just listening forget watching the scene you should just be able to listen to music and go yeah that would go great under uh, you know two you know two brothers talking about their you know deceased father you know whatever it is uh or you know chasing a monster through the woods or whatever it is you you feel attracted to write i mean you know some composers kind of focus on comedy and some focus sort of focus Generally speaking, our careers choose us far more than we choose our careers. Any composer who gets known for doing a certain kind of film, it's usually because they scored something and then everybody loved it and then they just get asked to do it again and again and again. You know, case in point, David Holmes. You know, once he, you know, did his retro loops and upright bass and bongos in Ocean's Eleven, you know, his career as a film composer kind of got cemented into, yeah, he's the retro guy with lo-fi loops. Um, and he's kind of built a career out of that and, you know, still kind of does it. You know, I know he's been writing some of the original music in Killing Eve. And I think he's co-music supervisor in addition to co-composer on that. Um, but, he, you know, he kind of stays within a kind of a narrow thing, which, again, does not fully reflect what he was doing when he was, uh, an electronic composer and a remixer. Um, he happened onto something that just he ended up getting asked to do again and again. So, what what do you do to get into this? You build you build a portfolio, both to picture and just standalone, and you make it great. In it should take less than five seconds should take less than three seconds of hitting from hitting play to saying, oh, I get what this is. One of the things about film music that I, we didn't talk about um, is emotional ambiguity. Something that is critical in writing music to, for media. And this is, this is true of writing for libraries, games, everything is that the music cannot be ambiguous emotionally from beginning to end. There's nothing intellectual about scoring. It is all in the heart and none of it's in the head. Even if you're writing very sophisticated orchestral music, and yes, that requires tremendous knowledge and technique of harmony and counterpoint and orchestration and a a, a massive skill set, and you may employ all of that. But the emotional content of that music has to be flawless from the beginning. And when a, when a, a, a director or a producer or an audio director hits play, you, you have at most three seconds to convince them that you get it, that your music isn't too big, isn't too busy, isn't too ambiguous emotionally. That if it's creepy, it's creepy. If it's mysterious, it's mysterious. If it's dramatic, it's dramatic. Uh, if it if it expresses wonder, it expresses wonder. You just cut to the chase. There's no. I mean, a score. You know, a cue and a score may fade in a bit. You know, kind of comes in unobtrusively, but there isn't an intro like there is in a pop song or a jazz tune. You you just you get right to it. You get right to it emotionally, if not thematically. So number one is no ambiguity. Number two is um, even even very young uh, filmmakers, TV uh, producers, and video game creators love thematic music. Now, 
theme can mean different things to different people. It could mean a melody and being able to take that melody and rework it and develop it and extend it and make it happier and make it sadder and, you know, play it double time and half time and, you know, being able to be very agile with a melody and that melody comes back throughout a project. But it could also be a motif. It could be a filtered cowbell doing and every time, you know, every time we're in the woods, you know, that could be a theme. But producers and directors love something simple that's memorable and you hear it very early, very quickly. Might not be the first beat, you work into it, but within a few seconds, there it is. And it all meshes together. So thematic writing, whether that's melodic or not, is still really sought after, you know? You know, in the old days it was, I want a theme for my movie that people will walk out of the theater humming, you know? I want Star Wars, I want The Sound of Music, I want, you know, Harry Potter. Um, it's much more subtle now, but in a way they still want the music to be memorable on its own in some way, some earworm, something that connects the audience to the music that's instantly identifiable. Typically that's through a theme. Hmm. No, so, uh, and then, you know, I would suppose, I, su I suppose I would add um, the ability to be simple, the ability to not, you know how uh, in early classical music, there is the idea of the concerto, a piece for orchestra and solo instrument. In a way, film and video game scores are kind of like concertos. There's always one thing missing, that lead thing, which is usually the acting or the main story. You know, that even a really full-throated John Williams score, once there's talking, something, something pulls back, something pulls out. He's very good at it. You know, they give him the opportunity to have those scenes with no dialogue where he gets to, you know, introduce and, and stick to a great theme. But once there's things happening, he tucks it in hard. What, go back and watch anything of his. He's, you know, he's a master at how to go from 11 to 3 and you don't notice it because Harrison Ford is talking. You know, Indiana Jones just said something, you know, whatever it is. And um, and that is a skill. That is uh, a skill, which is why it's important to practice. Grab images, grab moving pictures off the Internet and score them. And then how do you get them to into uh, in front of directors? Social media. It's not that they're not hit up all the time. They are. But, you know, look, if you have some cred as an artist already, they'll listen. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I've been performing in clubs throughout Europe, you know, for the last five years. Recently, I've turned to scoring and I think my, you know, I've come up with a style that fit, you know, that I think you would like because I've seen your last two movies or I've played your video games or I watched your TV show. You know, it's not random. You don't you don't just say, hey, I'm random composer and I'm reaching out to every director I can possibly get my hands on. You know, for the most part, they often don't answer, uh, you know, DMs and what have you. Um, but sometimes you, they do. I've certainly reached out once or twice on my own. Um, and uh, yeah, one time I actually got a project from just approaching a director whose work I really like. And I said, I really love your work. I think. I think I would be a good choice on on a project, and it actually did work out. So cool, um, you know. Uh, we're not going to have uh, film festivals for a while, so uh, a lot of composers hang out at movie festivals. But um, uh, the main thing is to get that portfolio together, and it needs to sound cinematic. You know. Part of not not to to belabor the point, and I know you're moving on, but there's definitely a thing of of directors want their stuff to look and sound expensive, you know, 
And music is a big part of that. They want the music to elevate the project, bring it up, make, you know, make the villain more villainous, make the hero more heroic, make the story bigger. And so that doesn't mean louder music. In fact, quite often it's, it's the opposite. So this idea of writing cinematically just means, I think it ties back to being unambiguous emotionally and creating a sense of size, which good EDM producers are so good at. You know, making something big and impactful and wide and, you know, those synths that just, you know, feel like they can fill a room. Well, you can adapt that. Mm, totally. Uh, may I add some of my own sort of insights, if you don't mind? Bring it. So in terms of like you were saying about, you know, networking, essentially, and getting that portfolio together, it's absolutely critical. And, you know, I found that out in a couple of different ways. One was the well-worn story that I've told a number of times about how I met and ended up working with Junkie in 2013. <laughs> and it was literally, I have a friend, Brian, who was working at the time as one of Hans Zimmer's tech assistants. And he invited me to go and meet Hans and everyone else and blah, blah, blah. And I'm stood there in Hans's, yeah, you know, that studio of his that everyone's seen, that everyone seems to love. And Junkie just bowls in and goes, oh, I know about you. Like, Sasha told me all about you. You're really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I'm looking for the hidden camera because I think it's like a practical joke. And <laughs> uh, he says to me, send me an email with everything you've ever written. I want to hear it. And it just happened that I had the show reel of everything, like all my dance stuff, all my practice runs for music to picture, that kind of stuff. And I sent it to him, and then within three weeks, I was writing music with him. Mm -hmm. So there's a degree of, like, like you were saying, preparedness there, and also, to an extent, being in the right place at the right time. Now, obviously, mm -hmm. that's going to be a bit more difficult at the moment, but I did actually... I went to a talk at the AFI, the American Film mm -hmm. Institute, which is obviously not too far away from yourself in Los Angeles. Ten minutes up the road. Yeah, great place. And one of the, I can't remember the name of the guy, but he was a really serious music supervisor, one of the top end guys. And his advice was amazing to people who wanted to get into this whole thing of like writing music for films and stuff. And he said, well, if you want to get your music actually listened to by directors and you're struggling to get direct responses from directors because like you say they you know a lot of them don't answer dms right but what he said was what you'll want to do he said first and foremost you don't need to know what other composers like a lot of composers they're trying to like network with other composers and it's like why would you why would you network with people who you're competing against for work it doesn't make any sense but he also said Actually, film editors are very useful people to send music to because what happens in some cases is that they will use your music as temp score, as you were saying before. It's very, it's very true. I've gotten a few projects from my music showing up in temp scores, and I don't even, I, I don't even know how they got to those editors. In some cases, it was unreleased material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. uh, there actually is an underground network of of there's a like a music server somewhere that editors and um, that editors tap for building temp scores like every every cue of every film score ever even not on soundtrack albums editors just secretly upload it and never makes the light of day they're not breaking any laws mm -hmm. but um, you know yeah getting getting your music uh, to editors I neglected to mention is a is certainly now music supervisors of course are always using looking for music to license as is into a project you know and with edm that typically means you know they go into a club um it'll be interesting to see in the next few years if there are many movies depicting people going into clubs mm. you know maybe in science fiction <laughs> <laughs> many many years into the future right you know in a parallel universe far far away <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> when dj still ruled the the planet yeah exactly exactly um, and the other thing that so, as, well, yeah. as well was and, about you know but I, actually paul um you're you're you, 
you're right that, you know, networking with other composers isn't necessarily going to get you jobs, but I, I wouldn't be where I am today if, you know, my, my origin story is that I was a synth programmer. I was good at synth, synth programming and sampling and MIDI and stuff, you know, when, back when it was still kind of complicated and time consuming. And I just became the guy. I, I started off working in, in pop music on records, but eventually all my uh, clients, if you will, were film and TV composers trying to be hip, you know, trying to be cool. And um, those experiences were so invaluable to me, first of all, because that was my film scoring school, was being a fly on the wall, sitting in on the meetings, you know, watching Hans Zimmer have a piece of music rejected, you know, watching Basil Polidorus and Mark Isham and a bunch of other composers who I worked for, John Powell, you know, seeing what their intent was, what they wanted from me, how they sat with directors and how they were very political, you know, how they were very savvy. You know, you can't learn that, you know, just scoring uh, YouTube videos. So. I'm actually grateful for all the other film composers who kind of took me under their wing, you know, employed me, showed me the ropes, you know, taught me lessons, both positive and, you know, very negative, um, some more applicable than others. And then ultimately there were those who had to turn a project down and brought me in or who were overwhelmed and let me do some ghostwriting. You know, once you've ghostwritten, then, which is really, I, I was a ghostwriter for like four years. And being a ghostwriter is, is I think, the best, you know, film, film music school uh, there is. It's all, you know, you don't get the credit, but you don't, you know, you don't get fired. Uh, you might get your composer fired, but um, no, that won't happen. Um, but it's, it's a great environment to, to polish. And then you end up with a great portfolio of music. Mm. It's so interesting about the whole ghostwriting thing because my experience of, let's be completely honest, I did a lot of ghostwriting for Junkie. That was what I ended up mm -hmm. doing. And, sure. you know, it, it's so funny about the attitude towards ghostwriting in dance music. It's like it's akin to like murder. You know, it's a, it's akin to I the cardinal totally understand. worst sin imaginable. But in mm -hmm. the film music world, it's like, well, that's how you build a career. It's like, if your stuff is good enough for, you know, I pull a name out of the hat, like Hans Zimmer or, you know, Harry Gregson Williams or whoever, if it's good enough for them to say, thank you for doing, like helping me out with that, that's good enough to go out with my name on it then that's actually yeah. like a mark of actually you're on you're going in the right direction and you can work with people and all of those skills that we're talking about are actually yeah, on point and you'll end up doing your own project you know it's not like anybody thought that steve jobs built every macintosh and iphone right you know he was the head and figurehead of a team and was the vision of that team mm. He told the team what he wanted, and they executed it, and then he presented it to the world. And that's not entirely a bad analogy, you know, for what some composers do. Not all, but, you know, it's understood in modern, in modern, in the modern world that a composer is, you know, has a team. I have a team. You know, a lot of it is geared more towards production than, than composition, but I have, I have, you know, I have a group of people who help me in different ways. Might be logistics, might be engineering, might be sound design, might be sampling. Um, it might be executing notes. Okay, they they felt this cue didn't go didn't go long enough, so please extend it for me while I work on something else. You know, for guys like Hans or Junkie, you know their their standards are very very high. So if if they need two weeks to write a cue there's no way they can finish on time but if they write all the major cues and then bring in uh, help to take those concepts and ideas and flesh them out into less more subordinate scenes you know I, there's nothing illegitimate about that it's 
you know, it might be sometimes you have to be a little secretive about it. It kind of just depends on who you're working with and what's understood and, you know, what the legalities are of other composers. You know, what if they introduce a, a sample or a phrase that has copyright issues? There's a little bit of, you know, some certain amount of care. And, you know, ultimately it is the, the, the lead composer's responsibility. But, no, ghosting isn't isn't necessarily a, a dirty word. It has been at times. And I think there are some composers in the film world who have abused the understanding. You know, it's like Chunky did a ton by himself before he brought somebody else in. Hans had an entire career before he brought somebody else in. And the people that I ghosted for were all very well established composers who simply couldn't write fast enough or in a certain way that I could. And I, I completed their vision. But, you know, I wrote in a way that meshed with what they were doing. I wasn't writing out of left field. You know, it all felt like that score. Hmm. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And then the other thing as well, just to kind of finish up on this, is to obviously get to know directors like you were saying before but another thing that came out of this afi talk was you know get to know filmmakers when they're in film school you know and a, and a recent mm -hmm. example of how that can become very successful is the the trajectory of of ludwig Jorensen, who yeah. basically got to know ryan coogler very early on when they were both at film school him doing music yeah. ryan doing directing and then they've rode mm -hmm. that wave all the way to Oscar success with Black Panther, and Ludwig's mm -hmm. just done the new Chris Nolan movie. He's just done Tenet. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a really... With Ghost Riders. Yeah. yeah, well, that's it. That's he, it. He's an example of somebody who has a very large team uh, behind him, both technically and creatively. He, He's as much a conductor, if, if you will, as, as a composer. Mm. But what he's doing is, is pretty terrific. Mm. I just watched Mandalorian, which oh. is as kitchen sink as I've heard. I mean, that score has a bit of everything. So good. Like, so good. No, no stones unturned. So good. So good. And there was, there was so many really good, um, like, little documentaries and stuff about how he, like, he developed that sound and how he got the motifs yeah. and stuff. It's just... Very, mm -hmm. very interesting, very inventive, really, really cool. So just to mm -hmm. finish up on the equipment side of things, I had a really good yeah. question from Magnus, one of our members here, and he's asked about yes, um, what about preferred or expected DAWs, Cubase, Ableton Logic. Now, Digital Performer used to be a big one, right, in the film world. Uh, yeah. Michael Giacchino one. still uses it, you know, wow. for his blockbusters. Yeah. Um, no relevance. At the end of the day, you're going to export everything as audio. It's going to end up in a Pro Tools session on somebody else's computer. Um, you know, some DAWs are better at dealing with tempo and meter changes, you know, but, um, you know, there are, I, I have friends who score in Ableton. I have friends who score in Pro Tools. I have friends who score in Cubase. I have friends who score in Nuendo for some reason. And I have friends who score in Logic like I do. It is of no relevance whatsoever. There is no superiority. The best on the planet is the one that you know so well you don't have to look at the manual and you know all the uh, the key commands because you're gonna be, you, you, your goal is to focus on the music and not the technology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So another question I wanted to ask you, and it's fairly relevant to me because you know a lot of people know that you know I lived in LA for a couple of years before moving back. <laughs> Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Do you actually have to live or move to LA to be able to make it? Nah, not or... anymore. You know, and I don't know. I think this. I think this pandemic might be almost the final nail in that uh, coffin of of proximity. Um, video games. I've never lived in the, one time. I've lived in the same city as the game that as the game developers. Um, but I've worked on games that came out of Tokyo, Osaka, Montreal, um, somewhere in Europe. Uh, the last one of the last games I did was done in uh, in London. Uh, the document I've never worked with a documentary 
director here in LA. It's all been Brazil, Canada, Hawaii, uh, Europe, just, just elsewhere. Um, you know, uh, my own experience has been that the only, the only field that seemed the most LA centric was, uh, episodic television, but that has ended. Uh, episodic television has moved because there's, they're just not allowing what are called spotting sessions where you, the entire audio team sits down with the producers and, and the writer usually and hash out music and uh, dialogue fixes usually at the same time. Um, but, but certainly to flesh out the music. I mean, it used to be that they just wanted, they always wanted you in the room with them because just emotionally they liked the vibe of, do you get it? Do I need to explain it better? Um, rewinding, fast forwarding. All of that's been, you know, put on hold and I doubt that it'll come back. So I, I'm kind of willing to say that it is modest to not, not at all uh, necessary to live in any uh, major production hub, you know? Yeah. Not anymore. Certainly not in games, certainly not in docs, not really in film. The technology has just made it too easy, you know? There are now these collaboration platforms that synchronize videos so that the video is in full quality on everybody's computer, but they're just the playback is synchronized. So one person kind of controls everybody's video and you can, but you can rewind and you can set markers and go, oh, can we go back to this scene? And, and everybody's on the same Zoom call. So it, they've recreated the experience of a traditional Hollywood spotting session you know, virtually. So, you know, I, I think there will be when, when this has all gone there, there'll be a few producers who say, Hey, I really want to work with a composer who I can, you know, be in the room. But, um, even before this pandemic, I, I was rarely in the room with the filmmakers mm. all, all done remotely. Yeah. And I always think back to the advice that you gave me that, you know, when I made the decision to move back to the UK, <clears throat> I always remember the advice that you gave me was like, dude, like just get on a plane two or three times a year, obviously when you're allowed to, but you know, get on a plane a couple of times a year, two, three times a year, go and r remind everyone that you're still alive and you've got music. The rest of it can be done yeah. remotely. And actually, you know, how we're talking to each other right now, is exactly how we work together on Generation 9 2. On the tracks that I provided for the soundtrack for that. You know, it was all done in 2017, completely remotely. A few chats on yeah, Skype. And, and that film was actually made in New York. Yeah. I mean, I met the I met the director a couple of times on the first film. I did his first film. And he was in LA for that. So we we had a you know, we had a close relationship. And it was good, you know, I think we built trust. I think it's easier to build trust when you're in the room, which is a nice thing. Uh, you know, I've, I, I always offer to meet with people face to face. You know, I'll, I'll get on a plane to wherever. Actually, I'm doing this Netflix film, which may fly me to the UK. They've talked to me about, you know, am I willing to come out? You know, and I don't wanna get on a plane right now, but if they need me to, I will, you know. They can pay my hospital bill. <laughs> well, dude, it's all free over here, so you're all right. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't... Yeah, well. Anyway, um, the bottom line is I think it's really uh, it's really shifted over the years between social media and remote, you know, uh, remote group meetings. It's, it, it isn't that important. Mm -hmm. Not great. A friend of mine who's a, a, a DJ in Vienna comes out to LA twice a year and he kind of sets up shop at a swank hotel or the Soho house. And he gets in, he calls up music supervisors and editors and anybody in the business. And he just wines and dines them for a weekend, three, four days. And um, it's gotten him quite a few licensing opportunities. I don't think he's gotten a uh, scoring gig. But he's gotten a lot of licensing for his music out of coming to LA and just saying, "Hey, man, you know, he's a cool, he's a cool hang." So people enjoy it, and you know, he buys him a drink. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly Not what I used year. to do. It's how we met. You know, I I met through we met through um, the British consulate because I was mm -hmm. kind of you know talking to those guys, and 
as I say, it was just so highly amusing to me because like that that story of you know there's a reason why that book is on my shelf and it's not because we met I, after we met. I actually read that as my main source of inspiration when I was actually doing my research uh -huh. project at Audio Thank Engineering you. College, and it was just <clears throat> so funny that you know five years later I'm sat on your couch like you know talking to you and becoming friends with you and, and later on collaborators so I would like to yeah, think that situation it worked is, out well yeah it worked out really it worked well, out well. I, look I, I admire what you do tremendously you know you you did bring a, a high level of of stylistic integrity and and know-how but I saw you apply it to a film and a scene and the first version that you wrote wasn't what the director wanted and it had to go through uh, a couple of 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 uh rewrites but you know you handled it uh just the way one needs to do it you you didn't you know you you, you didn't understand you know what 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 didn't they like and often you don't know what it is they don't like they just don't like it so you know yeah uh all good huh yeah, amazing, amazing. As I say, I think it's a testament to, you know, sometimes you've just got to, I, I get asked this all the time when I do master classes or, you know, I, I used to teach at universities. Like, how did you get in with people like Junkie XL and Jeff Rona? And literally my answer was, there's these things with wings, they're called aeroplanes, like get on them, yeah. go to one that says it's going to Los Angeles and then get off the other side, start knocking on doors until you get to meet people. Like, it really mm -hmm. can be that simple. It really can. Yeah. Add to that the, you know, the amount of production of film, TV, and games uh, globally has just been expanding. And the independent world of game developers in every city mm. and in no city and television being produced globally uh, is, you know, it's... It's not where you don't live. It doesn't matter. It really, it isn't just about people in LA scoring things that get done in LA. I'm in LA, but most of my work is being done with collaborators who are not in LA. So yeah, um, most film and TV in the United States is still produced and post-produced in LA. But it's become very unimportant. And it's the same for when you actually work with orchestras as well now, right? I mean, very not as much or very little gets actually recorded with real players in LA anymore, right? It's more like Czech Republic, the UK, that kind of thing. Depends on budget and union things. Um, generally speaking, the, the, the orchestral recording scene in LA is uh, a fraction of what it once was. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even composers with no budgetary constraints of any kind um, have recorded in other countries for various reasons. Um, my last orchestral recording was just in January, but, and I did it in L.A. But it was only, it was like a 35, no, about a 45-piece orchestra. Um, it wasn't hard to do. Um did it non-union, so it was sort of behind closed doors. Um, so smaller sessions are happening here. Bigger sessions are happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think the next film I'm doing, they've asked me to record it in Eastern Europe with an orchestra that they have a relationship with. Mm. No, it's interesting because uh, Kurt, one of our members here, has a, a, has a question about you know how often do you hire musicians to play different <coughs> instruments for a score and do you actually play any different instruments yourself? Um, yes, and okay. So, um, well, to answer the first question, I probably have collaborators, musical collaborators on about just less than 100% of my music. You know, might be a guitarist, you know, might be a soloist. Um, you know, I do it because I like having a little bit of external input. So, you know, I don't rely too much on sampled solo instruments. Um, so, yeah, a, a, a lot of my music, I bring some, I bring in a musician or a group, a smaller group or an orchestra when the budget and uh, well, when it's called for, you know, not every film needs an orchestra. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I do, but not always. Mm -hmm. Maybe 
maybe I should revise that number down a little bit. Maybe I do 80% of the time and 20% of the time is just me by myself. Just every part came from me. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have somebody who mixes for me, but my mixes are pretty good, mm-hmm. but they're not good enough. So I do have somebody help with that. And then, um, wait, what was the second part of the question? Uh, whether you play any instruments yourself. Oh, yes, I do. Um, uh, well, let's see. Over, over in this corner of the screen are a, a tiny handful of my very large collection of woodwinds because mm. I'm a woodwind player. Oh, no way. Um, over here are some electric guitars, bass, and an electric cello. And behind that is a, a, Madagascarian, a Madagascar harp called a valiha and uh there's a laotian khan and there are a ton of ethnic instruments that you can't see there's a uh, a drum called an urdu Mm -hmm. um that i i use and i have gamelons upstairs and um some more uh instruments off camera so yeah i'm not uh i am not a primarily an instrumentalist but i do play acoustic instruments on many of my scores, um, I don't know if you can see it, but there's I have a microphone on a boom stand that's like ready to record at a moment's notice. I have a little Neumann KM184, which is a great little woodwind microphone, but I'll use it for clapping my hands or tapping things together or, you know, grabbing a little percussion instrument and, <laughs> you know, and then, and then throw it into the Logic Quick Sampler, which just... I can do five little noises and suddenly they're on five keys instantly and I can start running them through a f- delays and filters and and envelopes and suddenly I have a thing. You know, I have a fairly substantial modular rig plus there's an ARP 2600, uh, a mini Moog, an original mini Moog, an original uh, Roland Jupiter 8. Nice. Um, I used to have a massive modular that I got rid of. I've, I've, over the years I've had everything. Um, but I'm so in the box now. These are just a few instruments that I still like, or I just I'm somewhat attached to them emotionally. This is a an Arturia Matrix Brute that I got last year. Yeah. Um, there's a a, a Moog uh, Dfam over here. Yeah, some things wicked, right? Uh, yeah, I do that all the time, and it's all it's all locked into um, a, a MIDI clock coming out of Logic, so. Logic sends out MIDI clock. For example, it goes into the Arturia, so the internal sequencer or arpeggiator can lock to it. It has a trigger out, which goes into the DFAM, so that the DFAM is locked to uh, the same clock. Then I have um, a USB cable going to, you can't quite see it, but there's a little analog sequencer up there, the the vector Mm -hmm. sequencer from 512 Electronics, and that has... Uh, trigger outs and voltage outs so that converts um i can actually pl- have midi go to my modular from that or to into into the the um uh roland uh, jp8 uh to the mini moog if i want to so i have logic runs the show and then i have uh 12 channels of audio digitally going back from there back into logic i think in total i have 24 channels of analog audio or no i'm sorry uh, 36 channels of analog audio that are that show up in logic that are coming from different parts of my studio so anything i pick up is just ready to record just ready ready to go and um and uh so i have a nice integrated environment but mostly it's in the box Mm. Well, that, that answers a question that Ray, one of our other members, had about, you know, can you do the whole thing in the box? And I think the answer Absolutely. is Absolutely. Yes. Why not? Why not? If it if it makes sense stylistically, you know, do do whatever the, you know, the film project, you know, asks of you. You know, put it this way. Um, if you don't have a guitar player who can come play for you, there are millions of them that you can work with remotely and meet over social media and pay them, you know, 50 quid or 25 quid, or would you do this for me as a demo? You know, I just, I just did it uh, a month ago, this Netflix movie I'm doing. Um, 
the way the way I got it was I had already written some music that they heard that they liked, but there was something that they were curious about. So I hired a guitar player to play on a demo for me. And I said, look, if I don't get the gig, I'll pay you. But if I do get the gig, I'm going to hire you. So, of course, he played the demo for me for free. And if I hadn't had him play live, it wouldn't have worked. Mm. Because I needed some intricate guitar stuff that just doesn't sound good with samples, you know, and some very expressive, you know, lead guitar stuff. And um, so he was happy to do it. And he's one of the most accomplished guitar players in L.A. He's played on I don't know how many hit records, but he loves working on, on films. And we've done four or five together. So it's easy. There's so many musicians looking for work, right? Mm. Especially now. Good ones who aren't on tour and aren't playing in, in, you know, clubs and bands and what have you. So, you know, if you think that your demo that might get you a gig would sound better if you had this and that, get it. Hmm. Amazing. There are entire websites of just musician, you know, available musicians. It's that, it's that, it could not be, the, the toughest part is finding the right one. Yeah. Yeah, and it's one you got to have like a, a relationship with, or you know, someone you can get a vibe going with, maybe. That'd be nice. Yeah, would be, would be, wouldn't it? But yeah, I mean, I'm so conscious of your time because I know you you're working on stuff. So, you know, I feel like we've covered a huge. Well, huge I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I have another. Well, I have a few more minutes. I thought, you know, we said we'd go till till the hour. Mm -hmm. If there's any more questions, I'm still here. But if we're if you want to wrap it up, I'm, yeah, I, I, mean, I had a great time. Let's um, let let let's do a little quick five minutes towards the end on uh, working for hire against licensing. Sure. So let's just because obviously that could be like a whole couple of hours on its own, right? In terms of like how yeah, I'll leave that one to you. You can you can handle that one. <laughs> but um, you know. I write music that gets licensed and I write music for hire mm -hmm. as a composer for games and TV and film. That's 100% work for hire. My licensing world is somewhat separate. I think for you, for you and your audience, Paul, it's probably a little less uh, cut and dry because I think most, if not all of the people watching this probably have you know, a substantial amount of material that isn't score material, but could end up in a scene in a movie, you know, could end up in, a, in an advert, could end up in a documentary, could end up in a game. And that would be licensing, taking something I've already done and paying me to use it one time versus hiring me, telling me, giving me my marching orders, letting me write and Typically, at the end of a work for hire, the composer doesn't get to own any of that music. Mm. I own a tiny, tiny fraction of the music that I've written because it has been work for hire, where the producers end up owning the publishing and masters. I still own the underwriting, underlying composition, and I get my I'm, I'm a member of ASCAP, you know, which is our PRO here in, in the U.S. We have ASCAP and BMI and a little bit CSAC, but you have uh, you have uh, PRS and it's same, same basic idea. So, um, you know, I don't get to own a lot of my music, but I do get royalties whenever it appears, uh, you know, on, uh, on streaming services or, or television. Um, and so, which are slowly merging. And um, so, yeah, so work for hire is, you know, you start from nothing. And at the end of it, you've created something. And licensing is, here's an envelope, you know, here's a here's an album I did that, you know, see if there's something here you want to use, and I'll charge you a few bucks to use a track. But for that, you're going to talk to the music supervisor. That's a completely different person in film and television, um, whose job it is to find the music that's going to get used in, in uh, you know, scenes where the music is in the scene, you know walking into a cafe, walking into a restaurant, walking into a club, you know, music, you know, buskers on, on the on the sidewalk, you know, music in a in a lobby, in a hotel lobby, whatever it is. Um, 
that's kind of the where the licensing scene is is pretty heavy. Plus, trailers are 99% licensed. Mm. Promos, adverts, that's a licensed world. And that's just that's a whole. We never even got into into that, Paul. But how you get your music into adverts, uh, music libraries, uh, promos, trailers. That's primarily a licensing thing, and um, there's a, you, you, you should definitely do a whole thing on that because then you get to be you get to just mine your catalog instead of adapt your your st- your your skill set as a composer. Well, yeah, you know uh, Jason Bentley, right? I know Jason. Yeah, Jason's going to come on and talk about that from because obviously he's a pretty heavy music supervisor as well as being an amazing dj and you know he put together Mm -hmm. things like the licensed soundtrack to movies like the matrix he's said you know he's committed to coming on in the future onto and do something similar to this where he can talk about oh he's brilliant he's 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 really brilliant he gets it yeah and he's possibly got one of the nicest radio voices you'll you'll ever hear in your life sure does yeah, seriously. He could sell snow to Eskimos with his voice, seriously. Like, he's amazing. He's a great guy. So uh, one final question. Do you have like a preferred type of like t- film, TV, game project that you like to work on? Like any sort of yeah. real hardcore favorites that you're like, yeah, this kind of thing's coming and I love working on this type of stuff. You know, uh, I mean, it's funny. The, the, the Netflix movie. Catch new episodes of Beyond the Studio every single week on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you enjoy your podcasts.